Welcome to the March 19th, 2024 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and we're going to begin with the roll call. Supervisor Brandau? Here. Supervisor Mendez? Here. Supervisor Macheco? Here. Supervisor Quintero? Here. Chairman Magsic? And I am here. All present. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the invocation and pledge of allegiance, and this is going to be led by District 2. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce uh, Liz Fields. Liz, if you could come up to the podium. Uh, Liz is going to lead us in prayer today. Uh, she is one of the original team members that founded Clovis Hills in November of 1991, and she just told me that they now expanded to five campuses, and so um, a lot of great growth and uh, her main role is helping people get connected at the church and feel at home through small groups, classes, and meaningful relationships with God and each other. She's uh, served, uh, she's been licensed to the ministry since 2014, and she's the pastor of discipleship and women's ministries. So if everybody could stand, and Liz, if you'll uh, lead us in prayer, and then we'll immediately go into the flag salute. Thank you very much for the honor of being here today. And I just want to say that it's um, such an amazing thing that we put God first before your meeting today and that you seek him. And I, I honor that and I honor you. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, as we lift up the Fresno County Board of Supervisors in prayer, we ask you to intercede on their behalf, seeking your divine intervention and guidance in their decision-making processes. We thank you for the dedication and commitment they bring to their roles, understanding the weight of responsibility they carry for the well-being of their constituents. We give thanks for the sacrifices they make and the efforts they put forth to serve their community with integrity and compassion. May your grace abound in their lives, granting them wisdom beyond their own understanding and fortitude to face the challenges before them. Lord, we acknowledge their importance in shaping the future of Fresno County and ask for your blessings upon their endeavors. May they be strengthened by your presence and encouraged by the support of those they serve. In gratitude and humility, we offer this prayer, trusting in your unfailing love and provision. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's continue for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge. I, I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number one, approve agenda. Board members, any modification uh, to the agenda that we need to note? Mr. Chairman, I do want to uh, mention right now that I'm going to have to recuse myself from item number 10. When that time comes, I'll have to leave the room. Yeah, not a problem. We will make that happen. It's under regular, so we will note that when we get to that item as well. Seeing no further modifications to the agenda, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. We now move to item number two, approved consent agenda item numbers 21 through 55. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, item 40 on your consent will be continued to April 9th. Duly noted. Any other items from consent that uh, need to be moved off so we can have further discussion, board members? Seeing none, anyone in the public wishing to comment on the consent agenda? might have one person. Please state your name for the record. And is there, a, is there a particular item you want pulled, or do you want to talk about the consent uh, agenda uh, in, in total? Uh, I'd like to request that item 32 be pulled. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pull item 32, and you'll have an opportunity to speak to that. So we'll deal with the remainder of consent, and we'll get to that item within like 10 minutes, if that's OK. Perfect. Thank you. All right, item 32 will be pulled. Uh, anyone else wishing to pull an item on consent? Seeing none, I'll entertain, I'm going to close the public portion. I'll entertain a motion to approve the remainder. Motion to approve. We have a motion. Is there a second? second. We have a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Motion carries unanimously. We now move to item number three under Board of Supervisors, presentation of retirement plaque to Jerry Madrano, Sheriff's Department, 31 years of service. All right. So I believe uh, Assistant Sheriff Ryan Hushaw is here. Okay, Russell, come on up. Uh, Chairman, board members, thank you for having us here today. Uh, we're here to recognize Jerry Madrano here. Jerry started his career with the Fresno County Sheriff's Office on February 18th, 1992. As a correction officer, Jerry served the Detention Bureau in various roles. He's worked at all the jail facilities, uh, and our jail transportation team. Jerry was a member of the CERT team for seven years, which is the jail version of our SWAT team. Officer Medrano completed his tour of duty as a member of our main jail team. For the past 32 years, Jerry has been a valuable member of the Fresno County Sheriff's Office, providing countless hours, commitment, and dedication to the Detention Bureau. Our Officer Mandrano is an example of an individual always willing to assist where needed and never settle with just doing his job. Jerry played a critical role in the development and mentoring of our junior officers. Officer Mandrano knew his job and knew it well. His commitment to officer safety and facility security were the two most important characteristics he held true throughout his career. Officer Medrano carried himself in a manner that exemplified the Fresno County Sheriff's Office mission, vision, and values over the course of his 32-year career. Sheriff John Sinoni and all members of the Fresno County Sheriff's Office appreciate Jerry's professionalism, attention to detail, and commitment. Thank you, Jerry, for a job well done. Congratulations on your retirement, and I wish you the best in retirement. Jerry, you have any few? Uh, do you have any words of wisdom for us? Uh, no, just that it, maybe uh, it was a blessing and an honor to serve the department for the amount of time that I did. Uh, the thirty plus years I'm thirty plus years was uh, quite an adventure, and I'm just. Blessed to be here and honored to be in your guest presence. And thank you guys for this recognition and the time you guys gave me. I appreciate it. And you'll always be part of the Fresno County family. So uh, well done. And we appreciate you making a career um, here in Fresno County. So thank you for that. And Russell, thank you very much for uh, speaking so well about uh, an amazing Fresno County employee. Any other comments from board members? Yes. Thank you, Jerry, for all your, your work over the years and uh, continuing to make Fresno County a better place. Uh, do you have any of your family members? That, I have that, my wife, Jennifer. Yeah. She's one of the main reasons I was able to complete these uh, the years <laughs> that I did. Her support, yeah. So what are you going to do now that you're retiring? Uh, as they say, you know, life goes on and um, life happens and it's continuing to happen. Uh, enjoy my family as much as I can. Right now I'm taking care of my father-in-law. Unfortunately, he had an issue last week, but mm -hmm. hey, I'm able to give him 100% uh, of my time and help him. And uh, Thank you for your service. All right, with that, um, I would, uh, Jerry, ask for you to have your wife come forward with you. We're going to uh, hand you a plaque and we'd like to take some pictures with you. So um, if uh, she'd be willing to step forward, please come forward at this time. of service, your name on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Thanks, neighbor. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Good Thank you.
We now move to item number four under Board of Supervisors, presentation of retirement plaque to Paul Andrews, Sheriff's Department, 26 years of service. And I think Ryan Hushaw is here for this one. Now it's me. Floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. I am Ryan Hushaw, Assistant Sheriff of the Enforcement Division with the Sheriff's Office, and I have the honor of introducing our most recent uh, retiree, Paul Andrews. Ready? All right. Uh, Deputy Paul Andrews was hired by the Fresno Sheriff's Office in 1995 as a reserve deputy sheriff. He was then promoted to a full-time deputy sheriff position in 1997. Deputy Andrews was assigned to the Court Services Unit where he would spend the next 26 years of his law enforcement career. Deputy Andrews has been assigned to multiple positions throughout his career, one of which most notably included being a court training officer for 20 years. During those two decades as a training officer, Deputy Andrews was responsible for training hundreds of deputy sheriffs about the daily job duties of being a deputy assigned to the courts. He was also a member of our judicial protection team for the past 19 years where he was responsible for providing protective details and security for judicial staff and dignitaries as well as investigating judicial threats. Deputy Andrews has always had a reputation of being a leader and a mentor as well as being one of the most respected deputies to work in the Fresno County Courthouse system. I worked in the courts for three months and I can attest to that, very true. Uh, he was always the go-to person when nobody knew quite what to do or needed a quick answer to a problem. Deputy Andrews enjoys spending time with his wife and six children in the outdoors. Uh, in his short amount of time being retired, he has completed many home projects. He's learning how to fly fish, and he's also started restoring a 1965 Corvair convertible. Uh, Deputy Andrews will certainly be missed by everyone he worked with at the Sheriff's Office and we are very excited to see him off into retirement, uh, healthy and well. So Deputy Andrews, on behalf of Sheriff John Zanoni and the entire Sheriff's Office staff, we want to thank you for your years of hard work, service, and dedication to the citizens of Fresno County and the Sheriff's Office. So congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. The floor is yours, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the recognition. Um, it's been a good 26 years, a good part of my life. Um, glad for an opportunity to represent the Sheriff's Department and the people of Fresno County. Thank you. Any board members have any comments? All right, Paul, do you have any uh, of your family members? I have here? my stepson here today with me. Well, I tell you what, why don't you have him come forward with you? We have a, a letter and a plaque, and we'd like to get a picture with you. We now move under item five under Supervisor Mendez, adopt proclamation to proclaim March 2024 as Women's History Month in Fresno County. Okay, we're gonna adopt a proclamation proclaiming March 2024 as Women's History Month in Fresno County. Attending for Fresno County Commission for the Status of Women, Commissioner Gail Gaston, Nancy Mays, Susan Blong, and Eve Castellanos, who's the chairman. Good morning, Supervisor Mendez, Supervisors. Dr. Eve Castellanos, Chair of the Fresno County Commission on the Status of Women. Thank you for having us today and proclaiming March Women's History Month. On behalf of the county's commission on the status of women, we're grateful to the Fresno County Board of Supervisors for proclaiming this month as Women's History Month. 
This proclamation serves as a reminder that we should remember the women whose shoulders we stand upon, those women who took bold steps and action to make history as artists, advocates, teachers, authors, healthcare providers, social workers, and various other professions that helped to strengthen the fabric of our communities. We should also remember the women who are often unsung heroes in our lives, those who have helped to take care of, educate, influence, and nurture us to develop into the people that we have become today. These women, these women may include our, our teachers, aunts, sisters, grandmothers, mothers, and wives. Women's History Month also serves as a reminder that there is still a lot of work ahead of us. Many women and girls continue to face challenges as they face brutal victimization in war-torn regions of the world. In some countries, women and girls are subject to discriminatory practices as it relates to accessing education. More locally, women and girls still struggle to achieve um, economic equality because of disparities in pay and lack of affordable child care. These matters serve as a reminder that while much progress has been accomplished to improve parity for women and girls, we still need to continue to influence the future through our efforts by advocating, educating, and uplifting one another. Today and throughout the remainder of this month, you can contribute to this by expressing your gratitude to the women and girls in your lives and asking them how you can best support their aspirations. Thank you. Buddy. Yeah, well, thank you for everything that you do and I'll uh, make a motion to proclaim this status, you know, for the Women's History Month. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comments? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Sal. Wanted to thank you for the the words that uh, you shared with us today, but and uh, also the comment that uh, of standing on the shoulders of uh, of women who blaze a trail. But I think that uh, I believe we need to commend uh, you ladies as well, and a lot of the other. Uh, women in leadership position today because you're blazing a lot of new trails and paths for future generations. So what you're doing now and the, the work that uh, that you're doing to make Fresno County better uh, really says a lot. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Supervisor Quintero. And with that, Supervisor Mendez, I wanted to mention an important person who's joined us today to represent youth in our community as we work hard to engage women and girls. Um, and that is the daughter of Supervisor Zhang. Um, her name is Pearl, and she's here representing the girls and youth in our community. Because again, we are working hard to try and engage as many people as possible and um, encourage them to work with us to continue to improve um, our communities. Good job. Anyone else in the public wishing to comment on this item? Gloria Hernandez, Mothers Hoping Mothers. I um, honor all my sisters here, but I especially honor the care providers who have been neglected by you all. I hope you pay special attention because this is Women's Month, but it should be every day to empower our women, especially the care providers that provide the service that is so desperately needed here in this in the Valley. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and I just want to thank these ladies for including us home care workers as um, important women to the community. Um, and I hope you guys can recognize that. All right. Seeing no further public comment, I'll close the public portion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Is it, uh, no opposition. That's unanimous. So please come forward uh, to receive your certificate. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. We now go to the item that was pulled from this morning by a member of the public on your consent agenda, item 32, approved by laws for the Community Parent and Guardian Review Committee. All right, and so we are now going to move back to item 32. And so this is uh, approving bylaws for the uh, Community Parent Parent and Guardian Review Committee. I know that there was a member from the public who had some comments. Uh, now would be the time if you want to come up and make some comments regarding, regarding item 32. Good morning, board members. My name is Jennifer Chow. I'm a staff attorney with the ACLU Foundation of Nor Northern California. You might recall that we wrote a letter to you in November of last year expressing our concerns about the formation of this committee. Since our founding in 1932, the ACLU of Northern California has fought to oppose censorship in all its forms. This board's insistence on conflating sexual orientation and gender identity with quote unquote inappropriate and graphic sexuality is discriminatory and dangerous, especially at a time when attacks against LGBTQ people in this country are at an all-time high. Young queer people deserve the refuge of books to find community support and to be seen for who they authentically are. We continue to be alarmed by this board's blind march towards censorship and will be watching closely as this process unfolds. The proposed bylaws and guidelines you're considering today do nothing to address the concerns we raised in our letter, and in fact present more questions than answers. For example, it's not clear from the proposed bylaws what constitutes eligibility for committee membership, or what guidelines will be given to the committee to govern the development of the community standards policy. Before you adopt any bylaws, the public deserves answers today or in the future about how the board will undertake to fill this committee. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna close the public portion and uh, we will see no further public comment. We'll bring it back to the board. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. A motion carries uh, with uh, four and one no. Thank you. That concludes all consent items. We now return to your regular agenda. Item number six, under Supervisor Brandau, approved community outreach expenditure of $6,000 to Fresno Police and Neighborhood Watch for the purchase of and replacement of Neighborhood Watch signs. You want me to take it away, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Um, as you... As my colleagues know, uh, we all have our own district budgets, but they're very tightly controlled. We don't get to go spending them on, um, you know, refreshments and all kinds of other crazy stuff. Um, so I'm going to stop that comment right here. But um, so sometimes when we do find a reason that we want to spend money, we actually have to come back to our colleagues and get it passed with a vote. And that's what I'm doing today because I'd like to spend $6,000 of my district money um, to support the Fresno Police and Neighborhood Watch program. So <clears throat> a lady named Mary Haskin, who could not be here today, uh, came and spoke with me a couple of months ago and then again several weeks ago. And over the course of time, many of the, many of the signs that promote Neighborhood Watch have uh, faded or been dilapidated or been vandalized, and they're um, in need of having hundreds of these signs repaired. But about 100 of them, are in Fresno County, not in the city of Fresno. Um, so they're in county islands or rural parts of Fresno County. And so um, I would like to uh, support what Neighborhood Watch is doing today by spending $6,000 of my district funds to help them um, make some new signs. And so this would supply about 100 signs, which is what the need was. And I know we looped in uh, the sheriff's office and they uh, approved of the design uh, because it has it has to talk about the support from law enforcement on Neighborhood Watch and then also the county website. So it's all very specific. 
All right. Any questions for Supervisor Brandau on this item? And I would just add, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding because it is in the county islands that this promotes the sheriff's department and um, for all of our rural residents as well. Yes. And these signs have to be different from the signs right across the street yep. that talk about the Fresno City uh, police force. So, yep, this is all approved by our sheriff's department. So, all right, excellent. Anyone in the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public portion, bring it back for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. So Second. Hmm, we're gonna have to flip a coin right. here. No, that's all right. Go yeah. ahead, I'm, I'm gonna give it to Brian. Yeah. So yeah. Brian will be the second. I we have don't a motion. Make seconds here, you don't. Yeah. So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna give it to you. So we have a motion to second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries with uh, unanimous support. We now move to item number seven under the administrative office. Received mid-year budget report for fiscal year 23-24 and approved proposed schedule for the recommended budget and adoption of the fiscal year 24-25 budget, which incorporates a recommended budget by June 18, 2024. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so Paige is, uh, I just want to compliment Paige, who works uh, with Paul Nerland in his office. I know I've been uh, talking to Paige quite a bit, and there's a presentation that she's going to have, but really appreciate the diligence that our uh, CAO's uh, office and staff uh, have put in to uh, bring us this uh, this update. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, good morning, Paul Nerland, your CAO. Um, this presentation uh, will be will be brief, but we want to make sure we answer all of your questions when it comes to the mid-year budget. Uh, this will give you a status for our current year as to where we are at, but also we're going to do a projection of what we're seeing for the 24-25 recommended budget before we come to your board for approval in this next year. Um, I know that uh, Paige is looking to bring up that presentation right now, but I'll echo uh, the chairman's comments. Uh, I want to thank Paige for all of her diligence and hard work. And I'm going to have Paige begin uh, by talking about the mid-year budget update and where we are so far this year in our current year budget. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. Paige Benavides, County Administrative Office. Uh, this is just a quick overview of what we'll be discussing today, as Paul explained. The departmental mid-year expenditures for fiscal year 23-24 were approximately 39% of budgeted appropriations. Revenues recognized at mid-year were about 28% of budgeted revenues, and these percentages were right in line with mid-year status uh, for the prior two fiscal years. Based on the estimates provided by departments, and let me pause here and just thank departments for their collaboration and their um, cooperation and responsiveness to all of my detailed questions throughout this process. I really appreciate um, their, their diligence. Um, but based on their estimates, it's estimated that both total actual expenditures and revenues for the fiscal year 23-24 will be approximately 92% of budget. Most general fund departments have indicated that they will be at or below their budgeted net county cost, or NCC, with the exception of the departments shown on the slide there. The sheriff department is estimated to exceed their NCC um, primarily due to higher than budgeted overtime costs as well as other uh, salary and benefit increases that were approved mid-year by your board. The county clerk or elections department is estimated to exceed their NCC primarily due to unanticipated unreimbursed ballot measure costs. The public health department is estimated to exceed their NCC due to higher than budgeted operational costs that are associated with the animal control services facility. County council is estimated to exceed their NCC due to lower than anticipated revenues resulting from fewer billable hours, but it looks like they may be on track to meet that NCC after all. So we're watching that closely. Additionally, there are a number of uh, other departments that are impacted by unbudgeted salary and benefit increases approved mid-year. However, um, several departments were able to absorb those savings, um, or the impact rather, of those increases through their salary savings. These mid-year uh, salary and benefit increases were necessary to improve recruitment and retention at the county and the department budgets will be monitored and addressed by separate board actions if necessary. It should also be noted that there will be an 
an NCC variance for the Department of Behavioral Health due to an accounting issue, which resulted in $18 million of additional revenues that were related to prior year expenditures. It will appear as though the department will be under their allocated NCC by $18 million. Um, however, these revenues will not be available for fund balance usage in fiscal year 24-25. Um, department staff are available in the audience if more uh, detail is needed there. So as we look ahead to fiscal year 24-25, we are going to review the status of our uh, major categories of countywide or discretionary revenues. Over 80% of total countywide revenues come from property tax. Uh, the fiscal year 23-24 adopted budget for secured property tax and property tax in lieu of vehicle license fees, which both directly correlate to assessed value, used a 2% increase over the prior year actuals. And we recommend uh, continuing this conservative approach to budgeting discretionary revenues in the future. And I'll turn it over to uh, Paul to dis discuss net assessed value. This is a slide that your board is, is familiar with. And although we, we, we tend to look at the, uh, the growth we've seen the last few years, if, if I want you to focus on any area on this slide, I might have you look back to the years 2011 to 2014 and, and notice that uh, during that time, growth was flat. But I know uh, from having been here at the time that our cost increases continue to grow and outpace that growth. And so at this point, uh, we are expecting growth to slow, but uh, at least on the revenue side, but as we'll see here in a moment, our, our costs continue to increase. And so uh, the message to our departments as we begin to tighten our belts is, is to prepare for that. And whether it, we, we always hope that the growth is higher than what we project, but I remember those years well, and many of you were here at that time. Um, we hope it's not that flat again, but we're seeing signs that it could be. And so I just want to point that out of lessons learned from 2011 to 2014. So Paige. Bradley Burns, sales tax is the second largest revenue stream uh, for countywide revenues. Sales tax revenue received in the first two quarters of the fiscal year 23-24 was 2% less than actual revenues received for the first two quarters of the previous fiscal year 22-23. It is projected that sales tax will be less than actual received in total for the year and will remain flat for fiscal year 24-25. During the last few fiscal years, we've seen record high Proposition 172 sales tax uh, receipts. Among other contributing factors, the impact of the loss of sales tax revenue in other counties due to the pandemic increased the county of Fresno's allocation of total statewide Prop 172 taxes. The unprecedented growth we saw has been treated as one-time funding. And based on these estimates we've received from our sales tax consultant for the current fiscal year and for fiscal year 24-25, we recommend continuing to treat any excess over our budgeted revenues as one-time funding available for public safety. As we return to more normal spending across the state, we're seeing the revenues return to more normal levels. Uh, Proposition 172 revenues received to date are at 59.3 million as shown there, and that is 5% less year over year for the same period. However, we've kept a conservative approach in budgeting these revenues at 107 million, which is at slightly below the amount we received during fiscal year 21-22 during those two years. We are on track to receive at least that amount and we recommend treating any excess again as one-time available funding. I'll turn it over to Paul again. As we look ahead to expected cost increases that are, are coming on the salary and benefit side for our employees, uh, your board and with our recommendation, there's been an investment in our employees. Uh, we've negotiated contracts with Every unit, uh, there's one MOU yet to come back to your board, but negotiations have been completed. In addition to that, uh, we've invested in health insurance increases, and so uh, that has been a what I'll call an investment, but those cost increases will be hitting us next year. Um, I think I also want to note that we're seeing some results from some of the investments that have been made with vacancies in some of our key departments beginning to come down. So that's 
a needed investment, but we will see the cost of those increases realized in this next budget, uh, which will tighten our belts. Uh, retirement is something that is increasing next year by approximately 3%. Um, other cost increases, as every agency and every business is seeing, we're seeing inflationary cost increases uh, across the board, whether it be uh, utilities that we're expecting to be a 15 to 20% increase to other areas that is just being passed on to the county like you're seeing in other areas. Our liability insurance is increasing about 7% in this next year. Uh, we are negotiating some, a very, really the county's largest uh, contract, which are our jail and juvenile hall medical services contract, which will have an impact regardless of where that ends up. It's a very, very large contract. And of course, we have uh, IHSS negotiations as well that will have an impact. So there's a number of cost increases, many more than this, but these are some of the big ones we want to keep our eyes on as we look ahead to the next year. Moving to the state budget, as your board heard uh, from our legislative advocate at your March 5th meeting, the governor's proposed budget projected uh, a $37.9 billion deficit and proposed a variety of spending reductions, delays, reversions, et cetera, to address the deficit, which could have varying impacts to the county. And as you're aware, the California Legislative Analyst's Office estimates a significantly greater deficit at $73 billion. The Department of Finance uh, February Finance Bulletin indicated that fiscal year-to-date cash receipts were $5.9 billion, or 4.8% below the forecast of $121.5 billion. Just last week, the Senate released an early action plan to shrink the shortfall by $17 billion. The vast majority of those proposed solutions were proposed first in the uh, governor's January budget. One proposed solution is to delay uh, $60 million in state general fund homeless housing assistance and prevention program or HAP funding, which will be discussed uh, in more detail as it relates to our county by our deputy CAO in the next agenda item. Uh, based on the grant distribu distribution timelines, this delay should only have a limited practical impact uh, per the state's um, action plan. The county administrative office and county departments will continue to monitor the state budget situation including any potential delays in the timing of payments from the state that could impact the general fund or discretionary interest revenue. Other potential concerns, again, as, as Paul mentioned briefly, we do not anticipate seeing the unprecedented level of growth in assessed value that we've seen over the last couple of years. In addition, um, we do not anticipate, uh, in addition to uh, less property tax revenue growth, and just as we're seeing in Bradley Burn sales tax, uh, we're also seeing le less growth in state realignment revenues, which uh, essentially is also sales tax and vehicle license fees. And that funding funds health and human services and public safety programs. Another potential increase in, op in operating costs for fiscal year 24-25 could result from the 2024 California Proposition 1, which is likely to pass. The proposition would make changes to the Mental Health Services Act, or MHSA, of 2004, modifying spending requirements and decreasing the share of MHSA tax revenue available for counties. The potential reduction in this tax revenue would not likely impact the county until a future fiscal year. However, the work of preparing for implementing the changes uh, proposed in Prop 1 would likely require additional administrative costs during fiscal year 24-25. The CAO's office will be working closely with the Department of Behavioral Health to continue monitoring the potential impact of that proposition. Given the anticipated reductions in assessed value growth, sales tax, and the state budget deficit, it is recommended that we continue to take a conservative approach in the usage of countywide revenues in fiscal year 24-25 to address potential shortfalls in the coming years. Overall, revenues are slowing, but costs are growing. As we move into the next fiscal year and beyond, we will need to seek ways to do more with less. And I'll turn it to Paul. I just wanted to address a, a, a common question that is coming up with uh, 
expected difficulties, especially with the state budget, and that question is, uh, will we be recommending or implementing cost-cutting measures such as a, a hiring freeze or hiring controls and, and, and when? And what I would say to you in that regard is uh, I would recommend that we are, are, are surgical and deliberate when we know right now the impact of the state budget and where those cuts are going to take place is unknown. There's some areas, as you know, we've got a high vacancy rate that it would actually hurt the county to put in a uh, hiring freeze or hiring controls that are that are overbearing perhaps and not what we need. And so my recommendation is, is we are deliberate, uh, maybe more surgical when it comes to that. Um, however, my message to department as they're listening to this is, as you are overseeing uh, your budget in those departments, uh, this is not the time for, for adding or, or for doing anything other than uh, board priorities and those things that are absolutely necessary. So you may hear more from me as to a recommendation in the near future as to uh, hiring controls or things like that. But at this moment, until we know the full impact, uh, not prepared to make that recommendation, I think it would do more harm than good today. But I wanted to address that. That's a, a common question uh, that I receive. Paige. And finally, the proposed budget schedule includes bringing the recommended budget to your board on June 18th. As the state budget uh, situation evolves, however, we will keep your board apprised of important developments uh, in the May revision. Final budget hearings will be held on September 16th, 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Any questions for Paul or Paige about this uh, mid-year budget report? Yeah, I do. Go ahead, I Steve. Have some. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Paul, my first question was one of your last comments. You talked about, you know, belt tightening, and you know, then you t you talked about hiring freezes and and you know, um, really looking at making cuts or being really conservative when it comes to employees. Are there any other area, instead of looking at it that way, are there any other services? And I know most county services are mandated. Do we have any discretionary services that we could look at before we look at employee employees? We do. So a couple of things we would say. One, um, when we did the salary increases that we did, and I recall you asked me a question, that we, we still have a large number of vacancies in our county, even though we're making mm -hmm. progress. And so that is an area that you know could be an option should we need to make cuts of vacant positions. To your point about services, that's the first thing we look at is what are we mandated to do as a county and what are the services that are not mandated but but are, are nice to have and, and come back to your board with recommendations. Our first focus though is going to be coming to you uh, as a board to determine uh, the priorities you know if and the impact of that but we we can separate those services that are mandated from those that are are not. Could you provide me and with a list of those services which are not mandated? Yes, I think I have it the other way where I've got the services that are mandated. But yeah, we can flip it to the opposite. And here's some that are not. Yeah, yeah I'd like to see it flipped because, yep. yeah, right. Okay. And then my other question before you brought that one up is, do we have any of our departments that you're concerned about that are kind of like a little bit over budget or, or that have you concerned? The concerns I have have more to do with the impact of the state budget and and. You know, if we were to guess where those cuts would have the most impact, it's going to be our, our human services department. So I am concerned about that. Um, I am concerned about the impact of Proposition One uh, in the it takes some of our MH, MHSA funds, and and we have less discretion over how those are spent. This is well intentioned, um, but the impact of that is something that we're going to have to to work through. Uh, those would probably be the ones that, that rise to the top. The jail medical contract that we're working through and, and the rising costs there are something that I'm very concerned about. And that affects multiple departments, but that would probably be the, the top of my list when it comes to concerns. All right. All right. I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other members have any questions? Go ahead, Sal, and then we'll go. No, go ahead. I, I don't have a question. Oh, okay. But I have a comment. Paul, uh, one of the uh, increases that I'm interested in uh, or something that can be added on to the, the budget is uh, last year we, uh, we the board uh, approved adding more monies to trash cleanup. And uh, that, that's, uh, I, I was real happy to see that happen. Uh, the other part though that I'd uh, like to see an increase with is, and it just happened in my office recently as you're well aware 
is uh, some of the uh, the older neighborhoods in the county have alleys, and they're a constant source of uh, of dumping grounds uh, for folks that'll you know come by in a truck, say I'll get rid of your trash for twenty dollars, and they don't take it to the dump; they take it to the alley and just dump it there. And uh, the this uh, last incident that we had was in the Cowell area, of course, and uh, the. Uh, uh, I'd like to see a little bit more money put toward uh, alley cleanups if it's not uh, uh, part of the, the regular trash cleanup that, that we have. And it's a little bit more sensitive in cleaning the alleys, but also I'd like to uh, maybe look at uh, closing off some of those alleys. Uh, I know we were able to do that in, in my uh, old council district uh, when I was on the city council that we were able to do that and work uh, with all the, the neighbors and closing them off. And uh, just took a little time to get it done, but it worked out really, it's worked out real well. But I, it's just becoming more of an issue simply because, uh, I mean, it's trash everywhere, no matter how hard you try. And uh, uh, some of those uh, neighborhoods you have, uh, the uh, homeowners are elderly and they don't have the wherewithal to go and clean the alleys, but that's that's just been a, a big concern and it's just getting worse. So I'd like to, to see that happen as well. And then the other one that you had was the, uh, the um, negotiated uh, increases. Uh, so are, are we gonna be uh, probably settling up most of our uh, negotiations with the uh, with the different bargaining units that we have? So we have one MOU that where they've reached tentative agreement and, and it is going to be coming back to your board, but my understanding is they've concluded negotiations. So that will close this round of negotiations as far as expired contracts. So that's very good news. That also include the uh, health care providers? No, no, that, that, that would be for the, uh, count, the MOUs for our county employees. Okay, so We'll talk about that one later. Yes. Then, I guess. Yes. Uh, Thanks for that clarification. A little bit but, later. Yeah. So yeah. just wanted to make sure that that gets clarified. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. And to your earlier point, I, I appreciate your comment. And I think the trash cleanup that your board authorized has been um, successful in that we're using it, but it's also going fast. And I think what you're saying is let's uh, let's spend money smartly to minimize uh, continuing problems that we're having to continue to spend again and again so we'll come back with options for, i think it's a great yeah it's and it's focus. it's kind of difficult in a lot of uh, those older neighborhoods uh, to tell the neighbors we don't have enough money for yeah. trash cleanup yeah. uh, in the alleys so uh, that's just becoming more and more prevalent in okay areas. we'll note that thank you thank you sir thank you mr chair just i think general trash you know cell is become such a big problem that we can't uh, we can't cut back from where we're on now because we need to find better ways of doing it you know closing alleys and have you but we've got a lot of rural dumping you know that we need to try to get control of one of the things that we cannot we need to tighten our belt but we cannot cut road maintenance especially in district one and four in the rural areas because the roads are so some of them are such bad shape that we need to, to, to continue to work on them and get stuff done. But I'll make a couple observations. Number one, going into this era, we have a way better number on what's going on downstairs in 2024 than we did in 2008 and 9. We have good, hard, real numbers. Oscar's done a great job the whole time he's been here. So we know the numbers are real. Well, we had <clears throat> a lot of fluff in the numbers before. They weren't recalculating the account balances. There was a lot of, a lot of guessing out there, which we're not doing today. Another thing that people need to realize that when they look at the governor's deficit numbers and look at the LAO's deficit numbers, we're not going to come up with an in-between number. The numbers could be could end up going higher than than the LAO's numbers, and we need to be cognizant of that because I think we're going to get the 
on programs that we're running for the state to get our reimbursement, I think one of their gimmicks is going to be just give us the money later. So we have to carry the, the ball a little longer. You know, it's, it's like uh, dealing with a customer that's in financial shape, bad shape, and they're slow paying. Instead of being regular 30 days, they end up being 90 and 120 days. But the people, you know, the counties themselves are going to be stuck trying to carry that. And some counties aren't going to be able to carry that. So anyway, that's a couple of observations. Uh, I, I think because of the big tech ticket items, sales tax is going to be slow for a long time. And then we're getting these higher and higher en energy costs because of these uh, goofy programs the state wants to run and how they want to run them. So now we have the highest electrical rates in the United States. So it's just going to continue to compound themselves. I appreciate your comment, Supervisor. Just a quick response that, uh, and I, I applaud. Uh, we work very closely with the auditor controller monthly meetings and, and come in with our, our numbers, and they typically match, which is helpful. We've got a good relationship there. Uh, to your point about the state budget, you're right that if they don't make some decisions soon, that number continues to grow. Um, the other thing I would just say, a message to our department heads, but also to the community partners that we work with. Um, this is going to happen fast. We're going to begin to see uh, proposed cuts or things that were being impacted. And our ability as a county and as a community to communicate the impacts of that clearly, but also quickly, uh, is going to be very important. So not, not just uh, surface level, but what's the real impact? And so department heads, community partners that are listening to this, that is critical going forward. And I've got a couple of comments. Actually, Steve, I'm going to get the last word, so you go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman, because I forgot about one. <clears throat> Paul, I, I forgot to ask you this question. You had mentioned animal control, and you and I have talked about animal control a little bit, but um, I know that there's been a lot of movement in that space. The, the city of Fresno, for instance, has um, taken what was a third-party shelter and brought it inside of government. So. Um, what is happening in, in that space for animal control uh, for the county portion? So the county continues to contract with Fresno Humane Animal Services, but to, to make sure we're taking a look at what's happening, public health has actually inserted a member of our county staff on site embedded with that team and working with them to essentially audit what's happening and ensure that from a business standpoint it's meeting our needs. Uh, we're also looking to work with uh, UC Davis to come in uh, as a consultant to also audit the operations and ensure that it's, it's meeting best practices, meeting our needs, and, and doing it efficiently. So that's in progress as we speak. So I would expect to be coming back to your board with options and recommendations relating to that. But that uh, staff who are embedded are, are there now. Okay. You know, I visited the new animal shelter a couple times since it, it opened, and it's just amazing. It's a, a, a beautiful facility, but it's literally already at capacity. That's correct. So, you know, just a little worrisome then. So please keep an eye on that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up to the public. Anyone in the public wishing to comment on this item? Please state your name. Morning, gentlemen. Bob McCloskey, thank you. Um, so we got the budget report. Of course, a lot, most of the funding is based on property taxes and sales taxes. Everybody pays sales taxes. Poor people pay sales taxes. Unhoused folks pay sales taxes. A lot of us pay property taxes. I pay my property taxes. Linda and I pay our property taxes. You're talking about less growth, less income. I get it. Do more with less. I get it. Let's talk about where some of the money has gone. I know you might think it's a small amount of money, but it's not. The public needs to know what the board is doing almost behind closed doors. You do allow hearings on this stuff, but when you make decisions on legal critical matters, it's in a closed door session and possibly subject to the Brown Act. 
one of the things I'm referring to, and before I get to that, I just wanted to say we heard that the county clerk's election and the budget office is over budget, and we know that y'all wasted funds to put Measure B on the ballot, which lost big time. That was a total waste of funds from the county clerk's office. How much did you spend there? I guess I'll put in another California Public Records Act request. I wanted to thank the county department that deals with CPRA requests because they did respond to me about how much money so far the board is, the county is spending under the board's mandate for what many consider a frivolous lawsuit. We know it's already been dismissed we know you're trying to appeal it. I want the public to know that Mr. Brian Layton, your outside attorney, is making $275 an hour. I'd like to make that. So far, the county spent at least 30 grand on this lawsuit with a projected for Mr. Layton 20,000 more. This money could be spent on hiring a social worker for a year. It could be spent to raise IHS salaries. It could be spent to help everybody in this county rather than a, go after a personal lawsuit from some members of the board. Public needs to know, they need to know, and as taxpayers, they need to object to this thing. I have to say no cuts to social service funding. We have a, a no, no, let's raise those salaries. We have a dire shortage of social workers. I voted no on Prop 1 because I know that you guys provide county social service, you're gonna lose funding. So let's do that. Let's fund everything appropriately. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Gloria Hernandez again, Mothers Helping Mothers. I'm kind of concerned about that statement um, that the elections department's budget was um, over. Something about not reimbursed. Now we know in the Fresno B or Fresno land somewhere, uh, the county clerk said that twenty to thirty thousand was spent on Measure B. Twenty to thirty thousand is a lot of money. For, for someone like me on Social Security, and someone like the care providers that are underfunded, you know. Steve talks about counties will be stuck trying to carry that. I'm sorry, it was Buddy that said that. Trying to carry what? The only thing we're stuck as taxpayers is your stubbornness to continue appealing the lawsuit on Yokuts Valley against the state. If we already spend twenty to thirty thousand on Measure B and the voters that spoken, you all should just drop the, the appeal. Stop paying that fancy attorney for something you know you're going to lose. Apply that money to needed services in the valley. I mean, in the in the county. Um, the Fresno sheriff is going to go over budget because benefits were increased and other items um, and higher overtime, according to what I heard. I don't hear that being applied to the care providers or the social workers, the people that are actually doing the work out there, servicing your constituency. You know, I like to know how many lawsuits you all have lost and how much it's cost the taxpayers because of your stubbornness. And again, when, when it comes to these items, I would ask for no clapping because we're going to have individuals who speak some uh, from with one set of opinions and others from a different perspective. So um, I, we will listen to both sides. But again, when it comes to those items, please no clapping. I'm going to close the public portion on the side and bring it back. I've got a few comments and I think that Brian has uh, some comments as well. We're going to start with Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paige, I appreciate your presentation and head on hitting the four departments that are over budget and giving a brief explanation as to why they are. It's very helpful, seemed reasonable to me. On average, um, maybe you or Paul, what is our average increase in our employee salaries that we've budgeted for the this past year? So 
So it's <laughs> I realize there's a range, you know, and all that, but on average, what of our what of our county employees, what are they getting for a percentage increase in their pay? It, it would probably average three to five percent, but if you add in if you add in the fact that you've all there's other pieces to it, like the health insurance increase that has been larger the last two years than we've done prior, uh, to adding a sixth step for almost all of our employees, it might even go higher than that because of that. So it probably average closer to five if I put those things together. Okay, so we can use the higher number, five, five percent, five percent. I think we need to remember that number when we talk about other employees and the percent increase that they want as well. I think that's an important number for everyone in the public to know is the 5% is generally the maximum that we do on a yearly basis. And maybe that would help move things along on other issues. Something to keep in mind. That was it, Mr. Chairman. All right, a couple of comments that I have, and I appreciate the public being here to, to weigh in. And I think it would, be, it would be beneficial. We all pay a lot of taxes, a lot of taxes. And with sales tax that uh, people pay, there's slightly different rates depending on where you are and what city or the county area, because uh, there are sometimes special tax rates which go to Measure C, Measure Z, and so all of that impacts the sales tax rate. But generally speaking, uh, people pay around eight, you know, eight percent in sales tax here in Fresno County, depending on where you are, and of that. Um, of the eight pennies for every dollar that you spend that's taxable, one penny comes back to local government. Now, the reason I want to point that out is we do pay a lot in taxes, but when you look at what local government gets, it's tiny. Property taxes. We all pay property taxes. We saw the chart. The county collects that, but the county, the county distributes almost 80% of that property tax. The number one beneficiary is schools. Of the property taxes you pay, schools get at least 60% and sometimes even higher rates, depending if there are bonds that are added back onto your, your property tax bill. Schools are very important, but I share this with you because when you see these big numbers, you're like, wow, why can't the county afford more? On average, the county gets somewhere between 12 and 13% of property taxes that are paid here in Fresno County. And again, I already offered up sales tax rates. We get one penny on every dollar uh, that is taxable, one penny, that is it. And so the majority of that money goes to the state. And so with the state facing challenges and reductions in, in revenues coming in, that further impacts us because the discretionary dollars we get here. So um, our Department of Social Services has the largest budget. Department of Behavioral Health has a large budget. Department of Public Health has a large budget. We take the discretionary dollars that we receive and then we leverage that so we can get additional state and federal funding. So if you want to know, I would love to, uh, at some point in the future, maybe sit down with some of you and just go over the revenues that the county gets, what we use them for, because our budget's $4.9 billion, but of that, only about $350 million is discretionary. And of that $350 million, which is sales tax, property tax, vehicle license fees, that is leveraged so we can get up to that $4.9 billion number to provide services to the public. So just some food for thought. Something to page. Um, on board priorities. I know Paul mentioned this. I think five or six years ago, the board made very clear with subventive departments that have uh, restricted funds, that they are to be spending their restricted funds first in a budget year. So um, are departments currently doing that? And is there more that we can do to make sure that we spend restricted dollars first before we spend discretionary dollars? I'll answer that second question first. Yes, there is more to be done, but um, we have been uh, working closely with the Auditor Controller's Office to enforce that board policy that was put in place to ensure that that is happening, that departments are transferring their restricted funds to the general fund uh, to make the general fund whole. And so um, the policy requires a quarterly, at least quarterly transfer, and we've implemented a monthly transfer policy. And so we'll be working um, closely with other departments who, who uh, receive those restric restricted funds to ensure that's happening. All right, excellent. Seeing no further comments up here, there is an action item. We're not gonna act on the report that you presented, but there is a schedule which uh, does require some action. So I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. We've got a motion for staff's recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. 
We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, carries unanimously. Thank you. We now move to item number eight under the Administrative Office and Social Services conduct public hearing to receive testimony on the local homelessness action plan for the Fresno Madero Continuum of Care Services area. Approve the local homeless action plan, including the use of homeless housing assistance and prevention grant funding allocated to the County of Fresno and the Fresno Madero Continuum of Care. Good morning, board members. Amina Flores Becker, <coughs> excuse me, Deputy CAO. Uh, and the item before you is the Local Homelessness Action Plan, which is part of the funding application for the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Round 5, also known as HAP 5. Um, so this round of funding came with some uh, previously stated requirements as well as some new requirements. This is the fifth round of funding. I'm going to go over some of those requirements here. Um, the first requirement, which wasn't new, is that over, overlapping jurisdictions are required to coordinate um, a regional homelessness action plan, as well as submit a single application together. So the members of the, the jurisdictions in our region include the County of Madera, the County of Fresno, the City of Fresno, and the FMCOC. I did want to point out that we have representatives from both the FMCOC as well as the City of Fresno partners here in case you have any questions specific for them. Um, the, uh, another requirement, which also wasn't new, is that the jurisdictions were required to engage with um, key stakeholders and community members as we developed the action plan. While that wasn't new, a new requirement with this round of funding was that we needed to conduct a minimum of three community meetings. Um, we, as a region, co uh, conducted six community meetings, two of which the County of Fresno took lead on. One of those was conducted in the city of Selma and the other in the city of Mendota. And I'm, I'm happy to report that both meetings were uh, attended uh, well and had uh, folks with lived experience who provided feedback um, that ultimately guided our action plan. Uh, final requirement, which is new, is uh, part of the action item in front of you, and that is that each member of the region had to commit to the homelessness action plan um, by entering into an MOU, into a formal MOU. So um, that the County of Madera entered into the MOU on February 20th. The City of Fresno approved the MOU on March 7th, and it is part of the action item in front of you today. So the Homelessness Action Plan um, has various sections to it. The first is the roles and responsibilities. And, and in this section, what the different jurisdictions did is we identified what is our role in these different categories and what is our responsibilities. I did want to point out that this section is very consistent with the CSAC at-home plan, which your board um, supported last year. Um, and, and in that it clearly identifies everyone's role in the region for a regional approach to addressing homelessness. Under outreach and site coordination, our um, county identified various things, but one of them was our PATH Street Outreach Program. Um, that is a contracted service provider that we contract through the Department of Behavioral Health. Under land use and development, Excuse me, we summarize the work done by the county to revise our general plan as well as the ongoing work to um, revise the housing element of the general plan. Under the development of shelter interim and permanent housing options, we identified various county funds that have gone towards emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, rental assistance, and the development of permanent affordable housing in the county. And then finally, under coordination of and connection to service delivery, uh, we summarize, amongst other things, the county's requirement for our emergency, our county-funded emergency shelters to act as access sites. And that's important because uh, in the case that someone presents with homelessness needs to a shelter, if it acts as an access site, even if there are no shelter beds, there are other services available and other connections to services available. And that is a requirement of the County of Fresno. Um, the next slide here are system performance measures that make up our, um, our action plan. And these numbers were provided by the state. They were taken from the Homelessness Management Information System. That is a system that all of the service providers in our region um, input data into. And um, this data spans, I'm not going to go through all of it, but this data spans through the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. So I just wanted to clarify that because um, they are large numbers. 
The next section of our action plan is the improvement plan. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these categories. I did just want to highlight some things that we summarized through the various categories. So under equity improvement plan, uh, we summarized the FMCOC's efforts to uh, and partner efforts to develop a new assessment tool that will help to ensure more accurate vulnerability ratings and appropriate matches to housing. Under plan to reduce the number of people experiencing homelessness upon exiting an institutional setting, we summarize some programs that we have that target people who are exiting um, jails and prisons uh, through our Belgravia Center program, as well as our SOS program, which targets folks who are exiting hospitals that have behavioral health needs. Uh, and then finally, under plan to utilize local, state, and federal funds to end homelessness, we highlighted various programs and projects that we have conducted that uh, have utilized No Place Like Home money, previous rounds of HAP dollars, HUD ESG home, um, and, and other funding sources. So what does this mean as far as the money that is uh, being allocated to our region? For our entire region, which again includes County of Madera, City of Fresno, FMCOC, and the County of Fresno, uh, we have been allocated a total of $25.7 million. Of that, $5.2 million has been allocated to the County of Fresno, $6.5 million to the FMCOC, $13 million to the City of Fresno, and $1 million to the County of Madera. These, fun these funds come with some requirements, including specifically that 10% must go towards youth programs, and that's about $2.6 million. A maximum of 7% can go towards the administrative costs to administer these funds. And also, I did want to point out that the state has identified supplemental funding that will be available later in 2024, but that will be dependent on drawdown of these funds. So... The way the chart on the slide here um, breaks down the funding plan for the entire $25.7 million. These are all different categories that are eligible costs under HAP. Um, and as you can see, the for the cross-jurisdictional funding plan, the largest uh, amount at 62% is planned to be earmarked specifically for interim shelter. Um, the rest of these categories include permanent housing for youth, uh, other youth services, rental assistance, uh, HMIS, which is the data uh, system, as well as street outreach and other categories. So specifically to the County of Fresno and the FMCOC, um, I did want to clarify the County of Fresno serves as the administrative entity for the FMCOC. So actually the item in front of you is um, the MOU. You will actually, if, if it's approved by your board, you will be entering into both as the County of Fresno as well as representing the FMCOC. So because of that, we put that money together and it comes up to a total of $11.7 million. Um, and this is the funding plan for the entire $11.7 million. It's not completely undifferent to the um, uh, cross-jurisdictional in that interim shelter is the largest piece of the funding plan. After that, we have rental assistance and, and the other eligible categories. So next, I wanted to highlight what this means uh, in the practical world, what this means as far as actual services being provided um, the next few slides highlight some programs that currently exist that have been at least partially funded through previous rounds of HAP. That includes the Sanctuary Transition Shelter, which is operated by Fresno EOC. This is a 12-bed bridge emergency shelter for youth, specifically ages 18 to 24. Maximum length of stay at the Sanctuary Transition Shelter is six months. And there are other services provided on site for um, these youth that are looking for uh, a more permanent uh, housing option. The next is Naomi's House. Naomi's House is a special population triage center emergency shelter. Um, Naomi's House is on the Pavarello House uh, campus and operated by Pavarello House. This is a 40-bed emergency shelter for women experiencing homelessness, so that's the special population. Maximum length of stay at uh, Naomi's House is 90 days, and again, there are other services provided on site. 
Uh, Monte Vista is a partnership with Fresno Housing Authority. Um, the county uh, leases, master leases 42 units of this facility, which are made available to families and, with children. The maximum length of stay here is approximately 12 months with a potential additional 12 months of assistance in permanent residence, and there is also on-site rapid rehousing services available on-site. Uh, next one is the Triage Center Emergency Shelter Services, which is the Welcome Center. This is operated by Turning Point. This is a 30 emergency shelter bed for a uh, center for individuals uh, and families experiencing homelessness. The uh, facility offers wraparound services to attain permanent housing and maximum length of stay is 90 days. And finally, um, we have our outreach services. Uh, I, I did want to just point out that the, our outreach services is a pivotal part of our homeless encampment resolution process. So these are the folks that are boots on the ground, offering services, offering linkages to uh, various services in the community. They are our first line of communication with folks when we are trying to engage them um, in the homeless encampment resolution process. So the next steps for the county, um, should your board approve the item in front of you, is uh, a single application will be submitted uh, on behalf of all of the jurisdictions in the MOU uh, by March 29th. Upon approval of the application, the state will uh, grant an agreement for funding. That agreement will be brought to your board later this year for <laughs> approval, and then the county will get to work with our partners in addressing homelessness with the ultimate goal of ending homelessness in our region. That concludes my presentation. I just want to did just want to remind you that we do have representatives from our partners um, in case you have any questions for them but I am also available for questions. Board members, any questions for staff? Steve, go ahead. You always look at me first. Oh, I look to my yeah. left first. <laughs> right on, okay, I do have a number. For starters, Amina, great job, I appreciate it. For me, I know this is about HAP funding, but then my mind starts going into some general questions about the homelessness things, and some of those might come out, but first thing is, um, and I appreciate everything you've done putting this together, you're kind of overseeing that homelessness niche need that we have in uh, the CAO's office. Uh, prior to you, we had Sonia De La Rosa, who was really in that um, space. And so I know, Paul, that we had talked about, or you had talked about adding a person to fill that role because Amina has a whole bunch of other obligations to do. So where are we at on that? <laughs> Smiling at Amina, I like, um, and I want to commend Amina for, despite the fact that she has a lot of other responsibilities, the work she did on this, which included a lot of coordinating work with our community partners, the city of Fresno's here and others, and so I just, I first want to commend her for that, because she's done an amazing job with that. But your board approved adding a, a program manager of our homelessness, uh, and that person has been hired, but will be starting with us on April 2nd. And we're excited. Amina's even more excited about that. So, Very excited. Uh, uh, but I do want to commend what she's been able to do uh, with the limited resources just by herself. I, I've been amazed at what she's accomplished with that. But we're excited to get that person. <clears throat> All right. Um, as you listed, you know, there's a number of these um, projects that I'm familiar with, like uh, Naomi's House, King's View. They do a great job for Fresno County. You didn't, I didn't hear anything in this um, presentation about the hotel thing. Is, are those not part of HAP funding or are they? Are you talking about motel vouchers? Yeah. The, yes. Yeah. So I, I didn't get into the weeds on all the different programs, but that is something that is identified in our action plan that um, we are looking at the possibility of extending motel vouchers, um, essentially leveraging CalWORKs dollars and and looking at the possibility of extending motel vouchers because right now CalWORKs recipients have a benefit of two weeks of a motel voucher and then they're done for the entire year. Um, so we, we are looking at that through this action plan as, as a possible uh, program. All right, is that Phil Sky right there? Phil, can I ask you a question? Sure. All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, Phil, for coming, coming down the street here. My pleasure. Spending some time nice with us be. today. I wanted to ask you about the hotel things because I'm, you know, I, you know, um, the governor and the state's um, priority has been to take some hotel space refurbish some motels, 
bring some homeless folks off the street, put them in the motels, but then those motels also go through a conversion to become permanent housing rather than shelter housing. Do I have that right so far? That's correct, Supervisor. And by the, for the record, Phil Skye, uh, City of Fresno, Assistant Director of Planning Development Department. Yeah. So these motels are now going through a conversion. There's one that the county um, helped fund, which was Crossroads, right? It's going through a conversion. And so um, what's going to happen once that's been converted to permanent housing for some folks? Where, where's the shelter space going to be at that time for the homelessness that we still see out on the streets and in our community? Sure, Supervisor. I mean, from the city of Fresno's perspective, and bear in mind, as Amina said, I mean, we are just one member of the continuum of care. I mean, collectively, we are responsible for responding to our community's uh, homeless needs. Uh, from the city of Fresno's perspective, who has 80% of the shelter beds uh, in our city, in our jurisdiction, um, we are working on a plan currently with our administration uh, to be able to provide some measure of replacement to ensure that we don't lose all of the capacity that we've built up there, mm -hmm. um, mostly on Parkway Drive, not exclusively on Parkway Drive, but mostly on Parkway Drive. Uh, and so that's a plan that is uh, currently being uh, generated at this moment. So how long until the impacts of converting those motels to permanent housing really start? How long till that all kind of comes into play and you think, okay, We've got to do something different about new shelter space. Yeah, Supervisor, it'll be phased over the next uh, few years. And so, um, as, you, as you mentioned, Crossroads is already uh, undergoing conversion. Uh, actually, the very first conversion, uh, which is now complete and being leased up at this very moment, is a project that was completed by the Fresno Housing Authority that the city of Fresno partnered with them on. Uh, they have another project that is about the same stage as Crossroads. It's uh, formerly known as Step Up on 99, also on Olive and, and uh, 99. So uh, these conversions are happening in phases. The city of Fresno just surplus three properties along Parkway Drive. Two of them are motel shelters. One of them is just vacant land that we had acquired. Uh, and so uh, over the next few years, you should expect that uh, most of our motel shelters on Parkway Drive will come offline. Okay. All right. Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. And thanks again for joining us today. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Uh, so, Amina, what is, you know, you talked about, you know, ending homelessness. And I know a lot of people have talked about that. And, you know, I'm, I'm very sketchy. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little more pessimistic. You know, we, I see the number of beds that are available. And it doesn't measure up, of course, to the, the amount of need. And, you know, we're, we're, we're purchasing hotels, converting them, you know, 50 beds, 80 beds, 120 beds, 200 beds. I mean, it's cool concept, but in the end, these, they're gonna be converted to permanent housing. And then to me, I don't see a game plan. Now I'm not, this is by the way, I'm not criticizing FMCOC, because their hands are tied in a lot of this. I mean, this stuff comes with strings attached. Mm -hmm. I'm just not convinced we're on the right strategy mm -hmm. to really take a lot of people off of the street and get them the help they need. So that's where I'm at. Anyway, I'm done. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Buddy. I actually have an easy question. At the beginning of this, this is pre-pandemic, we had only a small percentage of people actually accept services. Huh. Then the pandemic came and that increased by a lot. Where are we at now with people accepting services? So I can only speak to what um, I, the data that I get from our outreach service provider, which is Kingsview. And um, I mean, I, I can get a little bit more detail on that, but I know their initial reaction is, very seldom are services accepted. Um, they, seldom that they are accepted. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. But I can get more detail yeah, on that. Thank you. So, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you for the presentation, Amina. It was pretty good. Um, really uh, covers a lot of uh, the uh, the housing that uh, that's being provided. The uh, the one thing, though, that uh, that I'm interested in as well is that, and it rarely gets mentioned even by the media, whenever uh, the housing is provided or a new 
building is built to provide housing, uh, they never include, and I think we should mention it, uh, the other services that the county provides through the health department, through social services, uh, that are built into uh, providing that type of care. And even more, uh, the other uh, rise in clients now is, uh, is those that, uh, that are experiencing behavioral health issues that we're providing housing for them as well. So, I mean, it's just a, a potpourri of services that the county provides. And you can look at a building and it says, well, they're just housing people, but there's a lot more services that go into that uh, uh, building that are provided. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to clarify that as well, but I've got, uh, I'd like to uh, call up Laura Moreno for the uh, continuum of care. And Laura, I wanna thank you for all the, uh, the guidance you've put into that very quietly uh, the, uh, the agencies say you're not quiet, but that's okay. <laughs> they're, they're supposed to be. Uh, anyway, with it, the question I have is that, uh, is it through the continuum of care, the, the program, uh, and all that you're, I, I kind of look at this as the home base that you're overseeing, uh, to keep all the agencies together and on track in terms of the services they provide or are going to provide for, for new housing. And uh, that way, I think uh, you have, do you have monthly meetings or how does that work? Yes, so Laura Moreno, chair of the Fresno Madera Continuum of Care, and they are absolutely monthly meetings. And there are more meetings than monthly for the Continuum of Care. So we have a board of directors meeting monthly. We have the general membership meeting monthly, as well as subcommittees. There's a coordinated entry system subcommittee. There's a homeless management information subsidy, uh, committee monthly, as well as ad hoc uh, committees. So it's a very active group. So these different agencies are basically uh, come together once a month to see how they can help each other or improve the services or uh, ask for additional help. Uh, yes, there are about 45 members of the continuum of care and they uh, are meeting more times than monthly usually, but it's a very collaborative effort because the continuum includes not only our community-based organizations, our jurisdictions, our partners in health, our partners with the insurance companies, our partners in hospitals, in schools. Uh, so it is a very collaborative process, and it has to be. If we're gonna work on homelessness, then it has to be a collaborative process because none of us can do this on our own, whether it's the jurisdictions or whether it's the CB Okay. And uh, the, uh, the uh, client base, I get, I believe, that's growing and we're having to provide more, more housing are those clients that, uh, that have behavioral health issues. Uh, do you have any idea in terms of how many units we are providing mm -hmm. to date uh, for those uh, folks? I think we're going to have like 19 at the, at the, the new uh, uh, housing place, the Arthur on Blackstone. I think there's about 19 units set aside for that. So is that uh, PROMESA that we're talking about? So that's the first home key project that's Arthur. coming online. And that is, uh, as Phil mentioned, the partnership between the Housing Authority and the City of Fresno. Uh, and we were able to partner. She's talking about permanent supportive housing. Oh, permanent supportive housing, not the home key project. Any any program that we that we provide the services for, uh, specifically those with uh, mental health. health. Uh, so I will say that a lot of the home key projects do have uh, permanent supportive housing for those experiencing mental health issues. Uh, and so there's no place like home vouchers that are included in a lot of those projects that directly impact those who are experiencing homelessness and also have mental health uh, issues. And so that is a, a partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health, and they have been very much at the table around that housing, around those vouchers, uh, and been very supportive of those projects. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of uh, folks that are out there on the street that when uh, uh, the county shows up and asks them if they're interested in some housing or re rehabilitation, they won't accept it and just move on. So I think that needs to be mentioned as well. I mean, there's we can't uh, 
control. We're all, we're all human, right? Yeah, and so exactly. some people are mm -hmm. much more willing to uh, engage and some people are not. And that's in, in anything we're talking about, whether it's homeless services or any other type of services, people have to be uh, ready and also assured, assured that if I say yes, it's actually going to lead to something. Or is this going to be another moment in time where I say yes and nothing really comes of it? Uh, and so to be successful, we have to have uh, actual openings in our program so that if I offer it to you then and there and, and you say yes, then we can actually connect you to services. Okay. Well, thank you for the work you do, Laura. I really appreciate it. Thank and uh, I've heard good uh, comments from the providers and how helpful that monthly meeting is. So uh, thank you for kind of holding that together. And I see Susan Holt kind of just ready to jump in and say, Susan, did you want to add a quick comment through the behavioral health part? Yes, thank you. Susan Holt, Director of Behavioral Health. Uh, the question on the Arthur was a collaboration of our department and the Housing Authority. And of the units, half are allocated to individuals, adults, and um, transition-aged youth with serious mental illness served by our department. And we have applied in partnership with our development sponsors for every round of No Place Like Home funding that has been released by the state and Fresno County has been awarded in every round. So we also um, offer letters of support for our development sponsors, um, including our colleagues with the city, to provide on-site supportive services in any new permanent supportive housing developments. Well, there's some good agencies out there providing great partnerships, but thank you also for your guidance on that. Thank you. That's all I've got. Thank you, Mr. And Susan, since you mentioned the Arthur, I think the county's commitment's about 15.6 million over 20 years. I think 5.1 million was for construction of those uh, of that complex, and then the roughly 10 and a half million was for ongoing services for the next 20 years at that one location. Correct. Correct, and those service commitments are 20 years. Excellent, thank you. And uh, there was a question too about total number of units. Just going from memory, and I might be a little hazy here, but I think your department's been involved over the course of the last five years in uh, building or are currently under construction somewhere between five and 600 units where there is assistance through your department and your department's provided funding and or a commitment or sometimes both. Sometimes both. So it's it's significant. Significant. So I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. All right, I'm going to open it up to the public. Anyone in the public wishing to comment on this item? Yes, thank you. First, I'd like to address some of the questions the uh, board members have. I mean, Steve Brando, you have a great question about where are all these people going to go. Crossroads has already been developed into a permanent housing situation. They're, they're in the process of finishing it up. The people were, were actually, some of those folks wound up on the street, and some of them were elderly. As you know, I'm Bob McCloskey. I do direct outreach to the unhoused. I, I volunteer with the Fresno Homeless Union, with Des Martinez, with We Are Not Invisible. I want to take umbrage to what Mr. Quintero is trying to imply, that unhoused people don't want services. They don't want housing. That is a, a bunch of crock, if I may say in simple terms. I go out there all the time. I give people rides from the warming centers. We do direct outreach. We pass out sleeping bags, tents, et cetera. I wish you all do that. But I, I, very, I meet hardly anybody is service resistant. What, what they have now is low barrier shelters, which is good. A lot of people get into those, but they're full up all the time. Mr. Mandro made a good point. It's a, it's a small number of shelter beds we're actually providing. So before I get on with more stuff, I did want to say there are other options. The tiny home villages could be built. There's two pending in, in the city. Uh, they're, they're very low cost to build and they provide a number of small units for people to live in. We need a public built housing vouch program. You talked about Crossroads. You know, they got 14 billion from the home key funds. Then they got another uh, 20 billion and another four later on to make that permanent. And RH Community Builders, to answer your question, where do these projects go? It goes to RH Community Builders and UP Holdings. They own that building now. This was a publicly funded project the county went in on and RH Up Holdings went in on. These developers wind up 
owning these buildings. That's wrong. That's a giveaway of public dollars. And you're all in on it. The city, the county, this is a county funded project. We have to stop the profit taking. We have to stop, you know, the state spent 20 billion, 21 billion on housing and homelessness since 2018. People ask where all those dollars go. I can tell you where they go. They go to overhead administrative costs. They go to the costs and overhead of service providers, a lot of it. A lot of it goes to developers, tax breaks. I know part of that funding went to tax breaks for developers to build low-income housing. Where's the low-income housing? For that amount of money, you could build a lot of houses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all talked to us about this sometime. You had Bob, this Bob, hearing I need without the next speaker. We Bob, didn't have Bob, the, you've been get, you, you now are I'm taking, sorry, I just want to make one no, small point. No, we didn't have the opportunity to get involved from the beginning. Bob, you need to talk to us. Bob, you have three That's minutes. All I'm asking, talk to us. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Brandy News Vegas. Um, one, I asked the county to make notice about these hearings uh, more accessible and known to the community because relatively short amount of time since the agenda comes out. And really quickly, I don't have a lot to cover in three minutes. I question that services are rarely accepted and um, believe that that is based on a lack of understanding and what services are being accept, uh, offered and what the context is. Like Laura said, we are with people who are constantly wanting shelter um, and wanting services. Prior to the, the pandemic, the low barrier shelters, sometimes people turned them down because they would have to be separated from their pets or their partner, other limited things. Some women wouldn't go to Naomi's house now because they were assaulted in the poverty area and there's other reasons why people might have a reason to turn something down if it's unsafe or unviable. So this needs to be not a blanket statement. But uh, regarding the, the thing, uh, this report, <sighs> There are issues that need to be addressed. There's a lot of good things. And some of the things on here are idealistic and not reflective of reality. And there's a lot of frustration among the unhoused with this. We need accountability and oversight. Um, and we need a third party uh, to assess how we are doing and actually speak to unhoused. Regarding the shelters, and I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to talk fast. Many occupants reported that people are not getting supportive wraparound services. And this is broad. A lot of people are not getting case management that they needed. Many people have told us that they aren't being helped at all or inadequately. And people are being exited for reasons that are being that are avoidable, unreasonable, unjust, including timing out when they haven't been giving help and they have there's no housing available. People who have been exited out because they had a medical issue and they were a liability, and I've heard this in numerous cases, and they did not, and they were exited back out with their health issues onto the street. Or they were exited without proper process for reasons that are, other reasons that are very questionable. When shelters create a revolving door uh, back onto the street, it's costing you money and it should be a concern we look into. We do need housing, I know this only covers so much, and we need alternative solutions like safe camp and tiny houses in the county because we're still waiting for the city on that one. Regarding, for the, uh, we need these because displacement harms and not helps. Regarding unincorporated outreach, um, they say that on, in the report that people are being offered services, but most of the time they aren't offered shelter because there is none. Regarding heart, and I only have 26, 20, Second, um, Heart PD, it says that people are moved from illegal areas. There is no place to go. Their belongings are being taken from them, uh, including things that impede them from being able to get housing. One person lost their apartment because their idea, they will not allow. So I just asked for more oversight. Thank you. Hello, muy buenos días. Hola, good morning. My name is Ofelia Ochoa of the community of Mendota, and I know that there's a lot of work to do now with the um, um, uh, homeless people. My community is one of them that uh, has been receiving a lot, has been getting a lot of homeless people. We would like to cover the hole when the, 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 the child is drowned. We, they need from the beginning before they 
get to be homeless, ayuda, they need a lot of help, not only with addictions, that is very, very easy for them to no get an addiction right now. Uh, there's no la rent regulation. Se, eh, van People la renta are getting their rent. A, um, a mejor de I mean, uh, up, and ya they have que, to be homeless pues sometimes no because they cannot afford their rent. No hay there's no housing, in, enough housing. Están dando now they're giving a lot of visas aquí, for people that are coming into the country. Uh, I mean, people, uh, the authorities si don't care no, if they are going quieren. to be, where they're going to be, I'm sorry, that meant the, the people that come in does not care if they're going to leave, where they're going to live. They just want to come in. Nosotros estamos abogando we para are que trying to... Pongan una, la granja de Fabian. So they can install the uh, Granja of Fabiano, Fabian's farm uh, in Mendota. We're asking the community to be supported terreno, with a um, piece of land, pero no tienen, but they don't have one a because que of el lugar que está the place that está is lleno the de appropriate pobres. one is full of um, uh, homeless people. Esta granja sería this farm bueno that I'm talking about would be good for them to get therapy los with animals, tanto a los niños not only to ch uh, special a children, but every everybody in general. Y desde we have to start from there to support. So no in the future, we don't get to see this kind of problem that we're facing Les right now. Repito, and I say it again, we have to cover the hole when the, when the child is already drowned. Yes, we need um, a lot of mental health um, um, uh, uh, solution. solution. Ahí retiraron esa ayuda en la, eh, que teníamos they, en we used to have that kind of health, um, 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 mental health um, um, situation in Mendota. Entonces, es cosa que so it's not only that nos está la we need and we need to help the community on this. Y es lo que nos and that's what was taken away es from us. No because they said that there's not enough funds. Luego, there's not funding. It is when then later we get to see this kind of problem. Estos Entonces, suplico, so please, yo sé que I know you have a lot of things arreglar, in your mind, a lot of things to do, to uh, resolve. Que ayuden todo lo que es vivienda, uh, like housing, uh, salud mental, mental health, lo de las adiciones, addiction, para que no se estos so problemas. then we don't see this kind of, uh, doing that, working on that, we don't see this kind of problems that we have right now. Gracias por escuchar. Thank you for listening. My name is Juventino. Yo estoy en desacuerdo I mean, que me I, I disagree that you could proporcionar uh -huh, you can give housing to people that are into drugs. Because then we're motivating them to go on. Me que otras we would like to, for us to get another solution to the problem. problem because the problem starts with drug addiction. No en, no, because they're homeless. Si ellos dejan las casas, if they leave their homes, y a las drogas, it's just because of drugs. Y son las and que están those are the people ambiente. that are in, 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 in this kind of environment. Yo tengo años aquí en I've, been, I've lived in Fresno 36 years. Y he visto el I have seen the growth. En las drogas. In, in drug addiction. No tengo que decirlo, pero lo voy a decir. I don't have to say it, but I will say it. Soy I am a, 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 an alcoholic anonymous. Y con la gente and we work with people that are into drugs. Pero la no es but the solution is not giving them housing. It's just to work with them. Es todo lo que That's all I have to say. Seeing no further public comment on this. Oh, we got one more. After this, we'll uh, close the public comment. Um, mine is more of a question to the um, these people. Um, is um, I live in nine three seven two two, and is the old hacienda one that you guys provide homeless shelter for? 
Um, I don't know if that can be answered, but thank you. Thank you. And uh, we can have uh, Amina follow up with you directly about the old hacienda, but I believe it's still um, it's still providing services to my uh, to my knowledge. Um, so very good. Uh, I'm going to close the public portion. And any further comments uh, to Amina or to staff before we start uh, uh, having a motion? All right. I'll, oh, go ahead, Steve. <clears throat> you know, I rarely respond to public comment and trying to engage in 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 Bob. Bob, I can't see him. I don't know if he's still here. Okay. And Bob, you can be an irascible guy that's, uh, you know, your very strong opinion, but there's some concerns that you have that I agree with, and you acknowledge those. And, and I don't like the argumentative side, but it, sometimes that has to happen. Um, so here's where I'm concerned in the long haul. Prior to COVID-19, when I worked at the city, when I was over the city of Fresno, you know, we were looking at massively expanding shelter bed space. We, we were looking at what, what sprung structures, these huge tents, uh, the city under H, H. Spees and I took probably five trips. We went to San Francisco, we went to San Diego, we, went, you, we traveled San, San Jose, looking at different models, seeing where things were working, because the goal at that point was to really expand bed space. And so we were, you know, the, trying to get creative where, you know, we could add 300 beds and then 100 yards away at another shelter just for women and children. And really, you know, and then uh, the state of California, Bob, the state of California chose to put the kibosh on that model. And they f decided to fund the strategy of purchasing motels and converting them. So that was not a Fresno County decision. We play a role in that. In, in our case, we've only, I think, done a couple of them. The city of Fresno has done more. It fits more their role. So um, that's really not on us. That's a model that the state is pushing. I'm very skeptical of that model. And I even want to make a prediction that when that model goes bust, because you can't, the money's already running out from the state of California. So they're not going to be able to just forever purchase motels and convert them at this exorbitant price. So it's just not going to happen forever. And then we're going to be stuck with this massive number of people that need bed space still. And probably someday, without ever admitting that they made a huge dramatic mistake, because I've never seen the governor do that yet, we're gonna have to consider going back to places where we can put a lot of beds and help a lot of people in some of those models. And then the pandemic came and that was the final excuse. We can't have congregate, we can't have people close together. And they just put the nail in the coffin of that deal. But, but some of these models, you had the county, you had, um, you had um, uh, medical services right there available, and you build relationship with the people over time. You don't expect them to change overnight, but you build relationship with them, and casually you say, would you like to come get these services that can help you beyond just having to need a bed? And... Um, but that's all gone by the wayside until it quits working, and then maybe we'll have to re-examine that someday in the future. That's, that's just a philosophy thought, but I, you know, I've been so engaged in this over the years, and um, I'm very concerned about it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I think Buddy had a motion you wanted to make. Yeah, I have a motion to approve. All right, Buddy made a motion for staff's recommendation on this item. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It passes unanimously. We now move to item number nine under human resources, approve an increase in the county's employer matching contribution related to employees, County of Fresno, 457B deferred compensation plan contributions. All right, staff, it's all you. Thank you. Um, good morning, chairman and members of the Board of Supervisors. David Joseph, senior human resources analyst with the Department of Human Resources. I'm here today to present a recommendation regarding an increase in the county's employer matching contribution for employees in retirement tiers four and five who contribute to their deferred compensation plan account. Consistent with your board's previous direction, the proposed action seeks to increase the employer matching contribution formula up to a maximum of $50 per pay period, effective March 18, 2024. Approval of the recommended action 
is vital to ensure the county remains competitive in the local market and continues to attract and retain skilled employees. Thank you for your time and consideration of this important matter. All right, thank you for the presentation. Any questions from board members? Anyone in the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public portion and entertain a motion on this item. We have a motion for staff's recommendation. Is there a second? second. We'll take uh, Brian Pacheco's second, because rarely do I get two seconds out of him. So uh, we have a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to item number 10, and the Public Works and Planning receive update on present conditions and progress of development within Milliton specific pl plan area located along Milliton Road between Fryant and Aubrey Roads, approximately five miles northeast of the northernmost boundary of the city of Fresno, with special emphasis on the status of the surface water treatment plant and wastewater treatment plant serving the Milliton specific plan area and county service area number 34. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I'm going to have to recuse myself, and I wanted to say the reason was I took a contribution and you know the new rules that we are under yeah and and it could be debatable but I want to you know um, use caution and so I'm just going to dismiss yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. go ahead Steve chairman board members uh, Steve white public works and planning today's presentation is going to carry two items the first item itself I will be addressing in the background of the story behind Miller to Newtown CSA 34 as people know it in the various system zones of benefit. So in 1984, Millerton Newtown specific plan was approved and moved through many years of uh, environmental work and, and the like. And then in 2000, not, excuse me, uh, 1989, it actually had its first subdivision come in in what is now termed as Brighton Crest and the golf course and the like. Moving forward, 4870, JPJ uh, development moved in in 2010. Subsequent track, and again, eight years later, 2018, uh, with JPJ, and then finally for a track number uh, 6189 with the Yassimi Group or Granville itself with development itself. Currently, the state of affairs is they have an operating water plant and sewer plant. The water plant has some challenges. In 2017, there was a list of requirements set forth on to the subdivision agreement of JPJ or 48, 4968, requiring them to modify the plant accordingly with an expansion up to 100 gallons a minute to allow for it to treat what's called disinfection byproducts. It's covered under Title 22. And from that point until today, staff has been working with the developer and their engineering teams to resolve and fix the problem. Many of the options were completed, different treatment trains were tried, and now we're rolling forward to today's agenda item which is an agreement for funding a granular activated carbon system that would allow the polishing filter GAC system itself to be installed and constructed for $2 million and we believe resolve the issue itself. Item number two in the agenda item itself, I don't believe has received all the necessary signatures uh, and I'll turn to County Council for a presentation on that issue. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have been working uh, along with PWP staff and representatives of the developers involved up there. Um, we just sent out a revised draft this morning that incorporated the latest comments from two of the developers, which we believe will be acceptable to them, but we do not have feedback uh, back from them. So we believe we're close on the agreement, but we don't have final uh, sign off from the developers. All right. Does that conclude your presentation? Concludes the presentation. I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, so I've got a couple of quick, uh, actually, any of my board members have comments? Then I'll, I've got a few quick comments on this. So I know that when those maps that you identified, there were conditions of approval, and there are still open conditions on maps that go all the way back, I think, um, to at least 2018. Two maps that have open conditions, correct? Or is there a third map? Uh, 4870 has conditions still set forth on it for the construction of a permanent spray field. That condition has not been met. That's JPJ. And subsequently in 4968, it has the water plant condition on it, as does the um, 6189 has just the spray field condition on it, and it's in final punch mode. Most of the work has been done up there, fortunately, 
and these outstanding issues could be resolved with the funding source to be able to build a GAC system, take care of the water, but there's still obligation with respect to the permanent spray field to service the needs of the CSA. Well, I would like to see in short order the developers sign this agreement as it relates to the surface water uh, treatment plant. I know that there are outstanding bonds that uh, um, really, they issue those bonds until those conditions of approval are met. They're not met. I want to see the rest of those systems finished. Um, and because uh, I know that some of the property owners up there are contacting my office about issues that they're having. So uh, very quickly, hopefully in the next uh, couple of weeks, we can get everybody signed on. I think one developer of the three has signed, correct? Ben, you're correct. And uh, so we're waiting on the other two. And so hopefully at our next board meeting, we can take some action on, uh, on an agreement. So at this point today, I don't think this really is an actionable item because we don't have anything to take action on. So it's more of just an update. Uh, but I wanted to make it, uh, you know, present this today to my colleagues because I take all these things very seriously and we need to get the infrastructure up there completed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, we're going to move on to the next item. Item number 11, consider and adopt resolution accepting 2023 general plan annual progress report and authorized department of public works and planning submit 2023 annual progress report to governor's office of planning and research in California Department of Housing and Community Development. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Bernardi Mendez, Department of Public Works and Planning. This item comes to your board with a recommendation for acceptance by the Planning Commission. Uh, staff has nothing further to offer into the record, uh, but is prepared to make a full presentation if your board desires. Any questions? Again, this is the last time we're going to be doing this update for the 2000 general the plan. 2000, Moving correct. forward, it'll all be about the 2024 general plan that was just approved. So. I would like to open it up to the public to see if the public has any questions on this. I mean, it's a real simple item. I'm not seeing any. I will close the public portion, bring it back to the board for um, action um, uh, for this uh, report, just to receive it. Yeah, so um, we've got uh, a motion to uh, accept the report. We're on item 11 uh, from Supervisor Mendez. Is there a second? We have a second from uh, Sal. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And uh, that passes four with one um, absent. Absent. Yep. We now move to item number 12 under Public Works and Planning. Consider appeal of Planning Commission's denial of variance number 4153, proposing to allow creation of two substandard parcels, a 7.64 acre parcel and a 13.87 acre parcel from an existing 21.5, 1.8 acre parcel and waived amount standards to allow for 12 foot side yard setbacks where 20 foot side yard setbacks are required. And so with this, I do believe the applicant has asked for this item to um, be pulled and uh, they would like to work with the planning commission. It's my understanding. So I don't know if there's any additional comments staff needs to make uh, for item 12. <clears throat> no, I if, if hear any additional comments. We, we can present it, or if you would prefer, we can continue with the item. Uh, they had indicated it would be here. I don't see them at this point, but... Uh, we do have an a individual here, but I'm, I'm open to actually moving this item um, back to the Planning Commission, which is what the applicant has requested, so they can uh, deal with their new proposal as it relates to a lot line adjustment and some other things. And if we're going to make a motion to move it back to the Planning Commission, I do have to open it up to the public to see if there's anyone else in the public wishing to comment on this item. Seeing none, I'll close the public portion. Is there a motion that... Um, motion. A motion to move it. Uh, second. To take it back to the Planning Commission. Who's the second? Right here. All right, we've got a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. We now move to item number 13, Board of Supervisor Committee reports and comments. We're going to start with uh, Supervisor Pacheco, Supervisor Quintero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just uh, wanted to make a announcement. Uh, one of our uh, famous local artists, uh, Chris Sorensen, uh, passed away recently. He was 98 years young, was uh, basically called the Man of Steel because uh, his artwork was made out of metal and steel, and uh, he was just a, a great person. He was one of the founders of the Art Hop and owned uh, Waco Oxygen on uh, Ventura Avenue. So 
I know not only the arts community, but many people in Fresno are, are going to miss him. He was just a wonderful person and very friendly and helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Brandau. I have not. Yeah. Supervisor oh, Mendez. I got a bunch here. <clears throat> I'm proud to announce District 4 fielded five championship sports teams. Starting with Crothers High School boys basketball were the Valley Champs of Division 6. Crothers girls soccer was Valley Champions of Division 6. But the big one is uh, Crothers uh, girls basketball was a state champion of Division 3. So that's a Division five, six school actually going clear and winning a state title. And for the first time ever, Kalinga High School boys basketball team was uh, Valley Champs in Division Five. And uh, also uh, Reedley Emanuel High School and their girls basketball team was Valley Champions of Division Four. Unheard of. Excellent. Well done. I have a couple of items. Um, on consent, uh, there was a memorial certificate that was passed by our board for Fred Ead. Fred was a personal friend. Uh, uh, he owned uh, M&L Plumbing and worked on a number of affordable housing units that uh, I was a part of almost 20 years ago, and so he will definitely be missed. Also, I want to take this moment to congratulate both uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Sal Quintero and Steve Brandau. Uh, they are uh, advancing to the uh, general election and uh, wish you both well uh, with, uh, with that. And also to remind the public that today is election day as well. A lot of people aren't aware, but there is a special election taking place today to uh, fill the 20th congressional district seat, which was vacated in December by Congressman McCarthy. And so there's about 125,000 voters in Fresno County that have an opportunity to cast a ballot today, and so I would encourage uh, those individuals who are watching this video who maybe haven't submitted their ballot to get that turned in uh, before the deadline, which is 8 p.m. this evening. And I really appreciate um, James Coos and his staff. They've got two elections that have overlapped, and they're working constantly. I had the pleasure of producing a video just showing some of the canvassing that they were doing last week. Uh, and. Uh, Coos is going above and beyond doing somewhere between a 5 and 6% canvas where the state only requires a 1% canvas. He's doing that to demonstrate just the accuracy of the machines and the counting that are being used. And I re really appreciate him going above and beyond to not only run two elections, but uh, do some uh, his due diligence that he's doing to show that uh, um, our um, elections are uh, very solid, secure, and redundant. So he has a lots, of, lots of redundancies that are used, which I appreciate. So with that, we'll move on to the next item. We now move to item number 14, board appointments. Supervisor Brandau, anything? Supervisor Mendez? Okay. Um, for the Fresno County Fire Protection District, um, this is for the former Westside Fire Protection District. Be, I'm going to appoint John Diener. And the new term lasts until 9.30 of 2026. And reappoint in the Kalinga Huron Mosquito Abatement District, Joseph Lovelace, to a new term. Excellent. I know you were working hard on that. Uh, well, it's hard to find somebody in that district that first is qual you know, qualified to be on there. Yeah, they got to live in a small area. Yeah. And you found them, so well done. Supervisor Quintero, anything? Supervisor Pacheco? And I have one appointment uh, to the Sanger Del Rey Cemetery District just to reappoint Richard uh, Bubenik to the District 4-5 seat, which expired on January 3rd of 2024. And that is all I have. So with that, anyone in the public wishing to comment on any of these appointments we are about to make? Seeing none, I'll close the public portion, bring it back for a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And that carries unanimously. We now move to item number 15, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons desiring to address the board on any matter not on this agenda. So again, this is items not on the agenda, and we're going to have an opportunity to comment on items that we're going to be hearing in closed session, which I know that the IHSS item is going to be heard in closed session. So any members wishing to comment on items that are not on the agenda? All right, seeing none. Or, or you do have an item that's not on the agenda? 
No. We'll okay. Wait. We'll wait for other posts. Yes. I have one that's not on. Okay. Go um, ahead. So 93722, we have a lot of potholes. Um, I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if maybe we can look into that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Brand, I will look into that. That's his well, district. Uh, yeah, or, most of them are in the city of Fresno. So uh, okay. I mean, I just want, and I can help you if you want to get in touch with me. I'm very, I'll, I'll send out one of my staff. But most of those streets are going to be inside the city of Fresno. So it'll be under their purview. Oh. Yeah. I just wanted to, to say our animal problem in the city, all the stray animals and animals that we can't help that are getting run over, and then we have to look at them. Maybe we could do something about that if there's I don't know what exactly I have six at home already I can't bring any more dogs home but there's so many of them out that need help thank you for that any other comments on items not on the agenda yes okay hi my name is Bayard Taylor I'm from Yokuts Valley and um, I just wanted to start with a little uh, story I went to a community meeting this last weekend and they were collecting information. And I said, I'm, you know, I gave my address, and I'm from Yilkut's Valley. And they said, no, you're not. You're from Squaw Valley. I said, no, I'm from Yilkut's Valley. And, and she said, no, that's not right. And then she put down the S num name for, for where my address was. Now, this wouldn't have happened uh, well, this happened to me. I'm reasonably white, you know, but I was thinking, what if I was Asian or indigenous or black or Hispanic or some other thing other than what I am, half Norwegian and half Scottish? And I don't, I think it would have gone worse. And the problem is that, that we, have, um, we have an election that we just had, Measure B, I want to say, Thank you to uh, Mr. Coos for running a good election there. And, um, and the no votes came on, on Measure B to 91,465, which was 64% of the vote. The voters spoke loud and clear. And yet, um, Mr. Chairman, I noticed on the, uh, on the website, uh, the original 93675, you keep on referring to our place as S Valley instead of Yokuts Valley, which is its proper name and its legal name. So I, th I find that to be a contradiction. You know, you, you said on the night of the election that you would fully respect what the voters chose, but then you continue to use this name. And it puts us all in a terrible situation. The minute that I said, Yokuts Valley is where I live. The atmosphere around that table turned ice cold. There was hatred coming at me from this person. And um, I, just, I just find that unacceptable to be kind of encouraged by a board of supervisors which keeps on pushing this idea that we don't want Yokuts Valley for the name. So I. I, I want to close by just saying that looking at our history can be very difficult and disturbing. It really can. Um, but we must not just consider who we are, but who we want to be. And who I want to be is more inclusive and accepting and respectful of all people, including the original inhabitants of the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say that when you go into closed session, please think of supporting the IHSS workers here. And, and remember, we're still talking about items that are not on the agenda. OK, thank you. Yep. Uh, uh, Baird brought it up. I mean, it's sad, very sad, that some people on the 93675 website are threatening to destroy any Caltrans signs that goes up with the name Yokuts on it. Uh, we're urging you to abolish this lawsuit. It's become very divisive in our neighborhoods. No reason for it. After all, it is a name change. It's not like the end of the earth for people. Some people are making a huge deal out of it. 
There was plenty of time for input for local residents and the board on what kind of name they wanted. Instead, the board weighed in with trying to keep the S word. It's ridiculous to think that you're going to keep the word squaw, and I hate saying it, in the United States when Deb Holland, the Secretary of Interior, the Federal Board of U.S. Geographic Names have abolished the word. As I've mentioned before down here, it's in the same category as the N word and the J word, which is for Japanese Americans. It's only one of three words permanently abolished in the United States as a place name. Let's get used to it. Let's try to build unity. I do commend Mr. Coos for putting on everybody's ballot, ballot the correct geographic location, Yokuts Valley. And I'm sure it did make some citizens angry about that. But you know, all this, like I mentioned before in the budget, we don't have the extra money to continue to per pursue this lawsuit. Public may not realize it, but I was talking about a CPR request related to the lawsuit where you're paying Mr. Brian Layton, private attorney, $275 an hour to pursue this thing. And it's not going to go anywhere. We know, we saw the appeal. We saw the briefs. Mr. Layton, to his discredit, I think excessively used the S word. There was no reason for that. Why is he trying to just, why is he trying to denigrate indigenous people? The indigenous community has weighed in. A lot of the ballot uh, information that went out on that was from James Ramos, first indigenous member of the state assembly. He, him and a committee of indigenous leaders put that out there and they said, this is disrespectful to indigenous people. Mr. Magsig acknowledging that Major B was going down, and that, that mailing had an impact. When he acknowledged it was going down, he said, let's go with the will of the public. I urge you to go with that, sir. Thank you. And this will be the last speaker for items not on the agenda. So again. OK, sí, thank you. Uh, de nuevo, Ophelia. Again, eh, on Ophelia. Solo lo que quería comentar que Siento que en las primarias no hubo demasiada eh, acción para las votaciones. Uh, siento que se necesita endorsar más, um, no sé, uh, como la unión o qué sé yo, para que haya más movimiento, salga la gente a votar. Uh, mi padre pagó más de mil dólares para hacerse ciudadano. Él quiere tener derecho al voto, pero lamentablemente no son tan sensibles, tienen sus reglas. Él no pudo hacer su ciudadanía debido a que él no sabe ni leer. Um, él aprendió con trabajos las preguntas en español y llegando allá eh, le pidieron solo en inglés. Um, yo entiendo que ellos tienen sus reglas. Mi padre tiene 10 años con la uh, residencia, pero tiene 76 años de edad. Entonces, la gente que debe de salir well, a votar y puede votar no sale y la gente out. que no que the quiere votar vote, tiene esas dificultades entonces um, so that, siento que deben de ser I más sensibles porque él pagó su, paid, lo que tenía que pagar entonces él quiere votar pero no puede pero sí siento que hubo But muy poca gente que salió a votar. Se necesita más um, ayuda para que la gente so se people, salga a votar. So y quisiera que nuestro And supervisor like también este, nos pudiera apoyar sobre la granja de Fabián. So Hay una organización allí ya tiene el non profit 501. So, los animalitos ya They're tiene también. Animals. Solo necesitamos They el espacio, que lo, lo presten o lo vendan. Por favor, si puede apoyarnos con eso, Please, agradecería mucho. Gracias. We thank Gracias. You. All right, we're going to close uh, this particular item and move on to um, comment, commenting on items that are in closed session. So, Bernice, if you can, okay, because we're now moving on to uh, public comment on items that are on closed session. So, please step forward, state your name for the record.
Okay, hello. My name is Mary, and I consider myself an advocate for IHSS providers and recipients. Um, one of the union members is going to hand some papers to all of you so you can see what supporting documents we're providing. What I want to do today is talk to you about how the services we provide correlate with activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living that are referred to and have been for decades in the healthcare community in order to establish a person's level of functioning and it's how they develop a care plan to follow through with at home. Some of the sources we've used is the um, in-home supportive services site on the Fresno County website um, and we are identifying the descriptions that match those of the ADLs and IADLs um, in the National Library of Medicine. Um, just to go over briefly what these are, they, the basic activities of daily living are ambulating, feeding, dressing, personal hygiene, continence, and toileting. The instrumental activities of daily living are slightly more complex and um, actually the IHSS worker does more of them in the home setting than a CNA or a home health aide would. But they are transportation and shopping, managing finances, shopping and meal preparation, house cleaning and home maintenance, managing communication with others and managing medications. There's also something very interesting that is on the California Department of Social Services about paramedical services that are offered by IHSS providers. They need to be authorized and ordered by a licensed healthcare professional and uh, the provider needs training from either the licensed care professional or the person providing that we're providing services for. And these include administering medication or giving injections, blood urine testing, wound care, catheter care, and ostomy irrigation, any treatments requiring sterilization, enemas, tube feeding, and suctioning. We are like CNAs and home health aides, and our wages should reflect what they make. We have, we're giving you a comparison chart showing what we have gathered from Indeed, and we would like our wages to reflect our services. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm Sue Hammond. I am an IHSS provider. Uh, this month is Women's Month, uh, National Month, and uh, most of the care providers are women. And we aren't being paid for our IHSS um, duties, just like Mary just spoke upon, for what we do in home care. Uh, we would really appreciate our negotiations ending this month so that we can be provided the $20 an hour for what we do deserve as an IHSS provider. I've been doing this work for over 16 years, and I've had different clients where I've had to change um, their uh, urine. Um, I'm not sure what it's called, but anyway, I've had to do things like that. I have to bathe my client. There's just a lot of things that go into being a provider. Um, put yourself with your family members, say something happened to one of your family members and they needed an IHSS provider, wouldn't you prefer to have somebody that really cares and that is being taken care of by uh, having their health insurance and not going home and stressing over being able to pay their bills? I know you would want that for yourselves or even your family members. So please do care about what we do, do understand that our work is essential and that we are deserving of being paid properly. 
And I do ask that you um, finish our negotiations this month. And I appreciate everything that you all do. And God bless you all and have a wonderful day. Mary. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Ua Lugo, and I am staff with SEIU 2015, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I do have the honor of sitting at the bargaining table with um, some amazing IHSS workers. And as we celebrate incredible women throughout history and all over the country this month, um, I get to celebrate it here in this space with some incredible women uh, right behind me. Um, they are pretty amazing and courageous and quite a bit resilient in the work that they do. Um, during the pandemic, these workers were deemed very essential. And as we look into our future, there's another challenge that we have to face, right? How are we going to provide care for the boomer generation that is coming in? And um, you know, there's already a shortage of workers. Last year, more than 626,000 hours went unserved here in Fresno County alone. And it shows that there are people here in the county that are not able to find the care that they deserve and need. So Fresno County's um, IHSS wage is $16.60 an hour with health care benefits. So our caregivers, as Sue and Mary has mentioned, right, are made of the majority of women and women of color, and they should be treated with respect. Um, thousands of care providers are leaving the industry here in Fresno County, um, while the need for care continues to grow here. And so it's time for the board to support them and invest in these caregivers um, who provide critical infrastructure um, and care to our loved ones. Not only is it necessary for care providers to, pro to be paid a living wage and have access to health, or health care, but it's also good for the county, right? Um, our proposal, we would like to believe that would bring in $370 million from the federal government and more than $200 million from the state. So that's nearly $600 million extra dollars brought into the local economy here by simply doing what's right and standing for our caregivers. In Fresno County alone, the growth in IHSS consumers exploded over the past 10 years, growing from six, growing by 76% between 2012 and 2023. And so this is the only contract that the board would propose cuts to health care benefits and keeping essential workers at minimum wage. And so I challenge the board today to close this contract by the end of the month in light of the hard work that these women have contributed to Fresno County. And um, we've been negotiating this a little bit over more than a year, and it's taken longer than a lot of the Fresno contracts. And so we encourage you to think about the inequity that's happening here at this table. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further public comment, I'm going to close the public portion. and. Uh, is there anything that we need to report out from closed session? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Based on uh, developments over the past week, we will not expecting any uh, reports out of closed session. So if the board chooses, it may adjourn following closed session. I will entertain a motion to adjourn following closed session if the board. We have a motion by Supervisor Mendez. Is there a second? We have a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. We will adjourn into closed session. <laughs>